TLAC proposed two sets of principles, a set of principles around policy or the way a department or a college or a system might use assessment to make good decisions, and a set of principles around what makes effective assessment of students in courses. This video is going to look just at that. And we will look at basically all six of those principles, considering um, what is an example of a thing related to that assessment practice, what's a non-example, and why might that be an important principle for us to pay attention to. So let's start with the first one. The first principle that we're going to discuss is the issue of alignment, where an instructor starts with an intended type of learning, sometimes referred to as an outcome or objective or possibly a competency. It just means what we want students to learn to do during the course. As soon as we clearly articulate to ourselves, this is what this course is about, what I want students to know and be able to do, then we should next ask ourselves, what would we actually accept as evidence that students have learned that well enough? And we're thinking about a tool that distinguishes between students who learn it with the kind of depth and breadth that we want and students who learn it superficially. When we've aligned those two, then we can think about the instruction that we have, what kinds of learning experiences, practice, feedback, reflection, are going to really help students learn that outcome. This process all together is about accomplishing what we intend to with our courses and assessing what we wanted to measure. Let's use an example. If my goal is for students to become very good critical thinkers in the course, to think about context and apply some principles that I've taught them, then the assessments that I generate would have to be tests of critical thinking, where students potentially get some novel factors that they haven't considered before and need to apply what they learned in the course. Maybe I have an assessment tool or a rubric or a set of criteria that helps me distinguish between students who applied it in a surface way and students who really thought about it in a deep way. In that way, I have alignment between what I intended and what I've assessed. And my learning um, that students do is going to focus in that same place. So my students will practice doing that type of critical thinking. They'll get feedback on how well they did it. Those sorts of activities are likely to make them more successful in the end at trying to demonstrate my outcome. And the goal, of course, is to help as many students as possible successfully demonstrate the kind of learning that the course prioritizes. So let's talk next about the second example of these principles. And it is that assessment is inclusive and transparent. So students have equitable opportunities to demonstrate their learning. What that effectively means is that our goal is to help all students, despite the diversity of their background, know what we would accept as good on the far side of the assessment bridge. So those might be things like rubrics or checklists or samples or examples or the educator in the class talking through when I think about this, these are the key things that I think about as an expert. All of those things make it more likely that students would all understand what we're looking for. A non-example might be something like um, gotcha questions on a test that nobody has encountered but are from some very tiny detail in the textbook, potentially, or um, me just knowing what good looks like when I see it, but not necessarily sharing that with students in my assignment description. This really matters because research has clearly demonstrated that students who come from families with a long history in post-secondary, students who can hire tutors to work with them, have an inherent advantage around understanding what it is that a faculty member is looking for. At the same time, students who are international students may not understand cultural pieces that are associated with an assessment. Students who are uh, first in the family to attend university may not have had the kind of information that other students will get from talking to families and siblings. So this inclusivity and transparency is part of just ensuring that everybody has equal access. In addition to wanting people to have equal access, we want it to be true that we actually are using assessment to genuinely support learning. So let's go back to our critical thinking example. When we were thinking about the, the way between those two big bridge pillars, we were talking about what students would need to do to get good at critical thinking. Well, they might learn about critical thinking from the educator they're working with. And then maybe they practice doing some of the critical thinking tasks that are core to this discipline. Then right after they practice, they're gonna get some useful feedback that helps them think about how it is um, that they can improve what they've done. And then they practice again using the feedback that they just got. 
And this is referred to as things like assessment for learning. And it's about ensuring that assessment actually feeds the learning process. A non-example of this might be, I have a fairly substantial assessment that occurs. I get feedback about it, but then the course is over. And that feedback is just for another course. So the most critical learning task that I was doing, the thing that was really important for me to do well at, I didn't actually use the practice feedback practice cycle for. Why this matters is that our goal ultimately is to actually improve student learning. And so we want to really think about how can we use assessment to do that and ensure that as many students as possible are meeting those course outcomes. Let's talk about our next one. So this one really speaks to not just meeting the course outcomes right now, but the ability to really successfully learn long term. And this is about developing students' ability to learn effectively and preparing students to be self-directed, reflective, engaged learners over time, including after they leave us. So an example of an assessment practice that might work on this is something like self-assessment or comparing your work to a sample or example or goal setting or reflecting on the specific things you did that improved your practice since the last time that you did it. A non-example of a higher education practice related to this would be something like the classic 100% final, where a student isn't actually engaging in activities that help them self-direct or reflect, and there's no ability to develop that over time because all of the assessment is occurring effectively at the end of the course. The reason all this matters is that higher education is a stopping point along a long journey for students. And we want not only to give them key information and expose them to the core uh, philosophies and approaches of our disciplines, but to ensure that over time, they continue to learn as the discipline evolves. And adding these assessment practices is a way in which we ensure that that happens. Another way that we help connect our university kind of assessment practices to the student's lifelong pursuit of learning is through authentic learning tasks. Authentic just means something where the student does the kind of things they would do in that discipline when they graduate. So for example, if I'm in a scientific discipline, if I'm trying to do something that is as close to that discipline as possible, that might be the work I do in my labs. And for, for precise authentic um, information, it would be when I am thinking about the thing I want to study, I'm designing a specific hypothesis, I'm generating my own method of collecting that data and how I'm going to analyze it. Because those are the kind of things that a scientist does and that would distinguish that from somebody who just worked as a laboratory technician and somebody else set all of <clears throat> those parameters and they just gathered data correctly and without error. So really thinking about what is our disciplinary lens? What does it mean to think as a scientist and how can I design assessment tasks that do that? And that same would be true in various technical or creative productive pursuits or in the kind of things where we know we're graduating students into circumstances where they need to network and work with others. And so deliberately building that into our assessment and actually teaching it and grading it would be part of what we would think about if we were trying to generate an authentic task. A non-authentic task of that same disciplinary learning as a scientist might be um, a test, for example, that only checks knowledge recall. Because it would be possible that I could memorize and recall lots of things and not be a successful scientist later. Which doesn't mean that I don't need to have knowledge because scientists do. It just means knowledge alone is not enough. And the reason we're thinking about this in particular as a principle is we really want to graduate distinguished members of particular disciplines. And the way we do that is by focusing our assessment on the kinds of behaviors that will distinguish people as they move throughout their careers. The last thing we want to think about is kind of a negative part of assessment sometimes. And that is the issue of learner wellness and stress associated with assessment. We want to be thoughtful in designing and sequencing our assessment to genuinely optimize student success. So this includes thinking about the timing of assessments and how extended they are, the workload associated with them, and the amount of preparation that students need to do and how we can help them do that well. Um, so it connects to things we've talked about earlier, like, for example, making things transparent, 
but also to problems that we've wrestled with a lot in terms of how do we make the workload manageable and the thing not something that might cause academic integrity issues, for example. The reason that this really matters is we want to be actually assessing what students know and can do instead of how many competing priorities they need to triage at a time. When students' workload is very high and the stress level is very high, we actually don't get a good indication of what their learning was, and it makes our assessment less reliable in terms of determining who our effective students are or supporting students in their learning process. Thanks for your time considering our brief cup of coffee around assessment today. We look forward to the opportunity to talk with you more about your assessment process.